And welcome to the 68th annual meeting of the Nebraska Rural Radio Association. And I also want to thank those that will be listening to this presentation on air and on podcast from Lexington, Nebraska, here at the Holiday Inn Express Convention Center. Uh, again, my name is Adam Smith. I'm the operations manager for KRVN and the network coordinator for the Rural Radio Network. And it's my honor to have the opportunity to introduce the 2018 Nebraska Rural Radio Association Service to Agriculture Award recipient. This honor is presented annually to someone who has demonstrated significant contributions to rural Nebraskans. Former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Clayton Yider was presented with, his ver with the very first uh, Service to Agriculture Award in 1987. And since then, honorees have included Virginia Smith, Dr. Martin Massengale, Dr. Tom Osborne, Mike Johans, Howard Lamb, and most recently in 2017, Dale Williamson. The list uh, features many more influential Nebraska leaders. The 2018 Nebraska Rural Radio Association Service to Agriculture Award recipient is John K. Hansen. As Mr. Hansen makes his way up to the podium, I'd like to share a little bit more about him. John comes from a diversified grain and livestock farm near Newman Grove, Nebraska, but moved to Lincoln when he was elected president of the Nebraska Farmers Union in 1990. In the 105-year history of the Nebraska Farmers Union, at 29 years, he is the organization's longest-serving president. At the national level, John is the longest-serving current National Farmers Union board member, and within one year, the longest-serving board member ever. He also serves as vice president of the Midwest, uh, Midwest Agency LLP, as well as chair of their budget committee, and is the founder of the Nebraska Wind and Solar Conference. Again, please make welcome John Hansen. this award as well. John, here's our plaque commemorating this uh, award. We appreciate your service. And John, here's our plaque. Thank you. Thank you. General Manager Larson, the Nebraska Rural Radio Board of Directors, and their President Ben Steffen, board candidates, fellow Nebraska Rural Radio Association members, guests, friends, and neighbors. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for this prestigious award and honor. The awards that come from your peers and colleagues always mean the most. Again, thank you, thank you. First, as I offer my thanks to you in this award today, I must not fail to also thank those that deserve but usually don't get the credit they deserve starting with the love of my life, who comes from a farm family of eight children, northwest of Gothenburg, my wife, Karen. Karen, please stand. Karen is my better partner in all ways and makes what I do possible. I also owe thanks to my six younger Hanson family siblings that include three brothers and three sisters, who grew up with me and our family farm northwest of Newman Grove, and all their support these many years. There, I've got that in, so that ought to make Thanksgiving go better. <laughs> and, like all good siblings do, they keep me grounded, while making sure I don't get too big for my britches. I also need to thank my now three grown children, who are spread from coast to coast, for all the many times that they had to pull extra duty because their dad was off to meetings and on the road. Finally, I want to thank my extended organizational family, Nebraska Farmers Union, that has made all the work I have done the past 29 years possible. And like rural folks everywhere, they are smart, independent, supportive, patient, have a strong moral compass, believe in themselves, are committed builders of a better future and want to leave the land and water they depend on in better shape than they found it. You could not find a better group of people to work for, work with, believe in, and advocate for. It is my honor and privilege to represent them, and I'm not kidding when I tell people that I think I happen to have the best job I could ever hope for, which is to serve family farm and ranch agriculture and rural communities. And finally, I want to thank our veterans who put their lives and well-being on the line to serve our nation. 
we owe you a debt of appreciation that we can only try to repay. Thank you for your service and your example. Now, I was a 38-year-old green-as-grass farmer in more ways than one from northeast Nebraska when I picked up the reins of leadership of Nebraska Farmers Union uh, as state president in January of 1990. I was told it was my job to do the two KRVN weekly radio programs and not much more than that. About all I knew about the Nebraska Rural Radio Association was that our family advertised our annual Charlay cattle bull sale on KRVN, and we listened to their station for market and weather information. I knew very little about its history. Within my first few days on the job, then General Manager Eric Brown called me up to welcome me into the rural radio family and give me some background on how Nebraska Farmers Union was one of the four founding members of the Farmer-Owned Rural Radio Association and how our organization's Mondays and Wednesdays three-minute radio report worked. I really appreciated Eric's calm and reassuring voice and words of encouragement. He had a great voice. But I, I think he knew that I was still, well, a little overwhelmed. So Eric volunteered then lead ag reporter Rich Hawkins to help get me going. Rich was patient as I asked him one really dumb question right after another. He encouraged me to buy the same tape recorder and microphone as he used, which I did, which worked out really good for me, not so good for Rich. Our system back then to get our radio program to the station was to use a separate dedicated telephone line a coiled battery system, which wasn't plugged into anything, but did something really important. It was mystical, but you had to have it. And a tape recorder that we plugged into the dedicated telephone line and then played the tape recording for the program. This was a slow, somewhat complicated, and time-consuming process. So during one of my first phone calls to Rich, he asked me what I was going to call my radio program. I told him, I had not even given it any thought because I didn't know I needed a name for it. There was a long pause. And then Rich noted, well, I guess when you said you didn't know much of anything about radio recording or production, you weren't kidding. <laughs> well, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, so as I'm inclined to do, I laughed a lot. Rich did not laugh. For those of you who remember Rich Hawkins, I think it is fair to say that Rich was a bit hard to read sometimes. So I reassured Rich that his reporter instincts about my radio skills were dead on the mark, and that the only real thing I knew for sure about radio was that I had a face for it. Then Rich laughed. And from that moment on, we were good friends, and he became a great help to me, as did Vern Killian, who served as the engineer for KRVN. I owe all the thanks uh, to the folks who helped me along the line uh, in the Nebraska Rural Radio Association and continue to help uh, me to keep up to speed, learn the ropes, and stay on top of the ever-changing technology that we have. So based on Rich's question, Shortly after that call, I did some thinking about what I should call my radio program. I found that many of the names I like were already taken by others. That was encouraging because I at least had good taste because I was wanting to steal what other people already had. So I wanted a name that was clearly tied to agriculture, conveyed a lot of activity intensity, and was widely understood and reflected something about who I was. Now, I had been branding hundreds of calves for many years, and around our Hanson Charlay operation, when we ran our 350 calves through the chute for branding and vaccinations, among other things, there certainly was a lot of activity and intensity. And since irons in the fire was an expression that was very commonly used by both my grandma Ruth and my mother Cindy to describe to others about what was going on around the Hansen farm, it was an, an expression that felt like home to me. And so the irons in the fire 
radio program got born and got named. So not only has the Nebraska Rural Radio Association been an important part of my organizational life, as I have been working to serve family farm and ranch agriculture and certainly all the other organizations that are a part of this network and our state do as well. Uh, but for 29 years, for better or worse, I have been a, at least a small part of it as well. So when I do my kind of John Hansen famous back of the envelope math, I've been doing two three-minute Irons in the Fire radio programs per week for nearly 29 years. That amounts to 300 minutes a year, or 8,700 minutes over 29 years. Longevity counts. That boils down to 145 hours, or six 24-hour days, or 18 40-hour week days of Irons in the Fire program reports. And I have to tell you, as I travel across the state and I visit with people about a wide range of issues, I'm sometimes stopped by strangers who hear my voice and step forward to introduce themselves to the irons in the fire guy. I remember one such conversation at the state fair when a farmer near the Kansas border told me that we have been friends for a very long time, but I just didn't know it till now. Well, that memory still brings a smile. As I report these numbers, I suspect that our always conscientious general manager, Craig Larson, is doing his back of the envelope math, and he's saying to himself, wow, that's a lot of lost advertising revenue. <laughs> well, and he's right. On the other hand, it is also a lot of value to Nebraska Farmers Union as it is to all of the other ag and commodity organizations who are also offered airtime to share their activities and issues. On behalf of all of us who are a part of that process, we thank the Nebraska Rural Radio Association for providing us this opportunity to visit with rural Nebraska. Your commitment to organizations that serve the rural community is greatly appreciated. Thank you. As a 39-year-old farmer first elected to a statewide position, I was warmly welcomed into the Nebraska Rural Radio family by General Manager Eric Brown, the Board of Directors, management, and staff. I was quite impressed with the high level of commitment to quality journalism, weather and market information, and their efforts to serve a wide range of needs in rural communities from the very beginning. It was a remarkable, a remarkable uh, event to be a part of those meetings and those considerations. In addition, I was deeply impressed with the organization's business-like yet positive energy, their future-looking thinking, their do-what-it-takes-to, yet-or-done work ethics. It's don't take yourself too seriously sense of humor which we all need, real appreciation for diversity of background and perspective, commitment to team goals and strong family-friendly values. I came home from my first association board meeting in Lexington in March of 1990, knowing there was something very unique and special about the Nebraska Rural Radio Association organization. 29 years later, my view of our ever-changing, always in search of new and better ways to do things, rural radio organization continues to amaze and impress me. The Nebraska Rural Radio is not only the home of the largest farm radio station in the nation, but it's the home of the largest farmer-owned radio network in the country. While many Nebraskans may take our unique farmer-owned radio network for granted, when I describe our farmer-owned radio network to our other Farmers Union State presidents around the country, that's when you quickly learn just how badly they wish they had a similar network in their state. Let's give our staff, management, and officers of our unique and remarkable organization a big hand of appreciation.
and let us never take them for granted. In fact, if you are not currently a member of the association, go to their website, sign up. It'll be one of the best investments you will ever make. And for longtime members, remember, it's our responsibility as owners to be active in our own organization, keep its, its, its interests dear, and spread the word. That's the very least we can do. And so while I'm passing out thanks and praise, I want also as secretary for Nebraska's also unique Nebraska Rural Response Council, the longest continuously serving rural response hotline in the nation that was started in 1984, uh, want to say many thanks to the Nebraska Rural Radio Association for running their public service spots that they developed to air to let rural folks know that when they need help, there is a trained and professional farm wife at the other end of the farm line to help them get the, inf the help or information they need when they call 800-464-0258. That's 800-464-0258. Notice how I just kind of casually worked that number in. There is an array of services to help families in crisis. And after serving on that board for 29 years, I will tell you that a little bit of help at the right time makes a world of difference. I have some what ifs for you to consider today. While we celebrate the successes of our Nebraska Rural Radio Association, have we ever stopped to ponder what might have happened some 70 years ago, if the Nebraska Co-op Council, the Nebraska Farm Bureau, the Nebraska Grange, and the Nebraska Farmers Union were not willing to set aside their minor differences to work together to meet a common need for the greater rural community? After all, that's what most folks would expect to happen. What if the organization's territorial and competing membership interests were considered a higher priority? What if the personal egos of the leaders were too big to put themselves on an equal level with their peers? What if their differing political agendas were thought to be more important? What if the old wounds from past conflicts were too deep to heal? What if everyone was more concerned who got the credit than they were with whether or not the mission itself got accomplished. If 70 years ago the four founding organizations had not been willing to set aside minor differences and selfish motives in order to work for their neighbors for the common good, we would not be here today because the Nebraska Rural Radio Association would not have been created. The reading of our rural radio history shows that all the efforts, talents, and resources of all the players and our friends were needed to accomplish this audacious mission. What a terrible loss it would have been for rural Nebraska to not have this wonderful farmer-owned network. The fact that the four organizations stepped up, did come together, did set aside their minor differences, and did work together on behalf of the whole community serves to remind us all what we're capable of doing when we work together and harness the power of cooperation. I often wonder how many more missed opportunities Real America can afford to miss because the folks who represent agriculture fail to work together. Let's take a quick look at what's going on in Real America today. Far too many farm and ranch families are facing enormous financial stress these days as a result of failed federal farm policy, non-competitive agricultural markets, and a national trade policy that focuses on volume at the expense of fair value. Increased volume times a loss still equals a loss. I know that's true because I took Ag Econ at UNL. And I had to sit across from my banker once a year and explain to him why I did or didn't cash flow. 
We are now in the fifth year of cost of production commodity prices. We have half as much net farm income as we did five years ago. Many of our good young farmers and neighbors that started in agriculture a few years ago when we had better prices are not going to get their ag loans renewed this winter. Agriculture is facing the worst financial crisis since the mid-1980s. Yet, you would never know that based on the response of many of our public officials at both the state or the federal levels. They don't seem to think it's their job to respond to the crisis that's on their watch. But I have to tell you that as versely impacted citizens, it is our job to remind our public officials of the situation we are facing and ask them to respond in an effective and appropriate manner. I was a public official for 14 years, and I have to tell you that the communications obligation goes both ways. When you're a public official, you are not a mind reader. What you do know is who calls. And if no one calls, people must be okay with what's going on. And I'll also tell you as a public official, I used to be the, the chair of the Lower Elkhorn Natural Resources District uh, Budget Committee, uh, and as hard as I work to put together the best, most appropriate, most frugal budget year after year, I never once had a taxpayer call up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go, my God, that was a great budget. It was so clear. It was so transparent. It so shared our values and needs of our district. God bless you. But it's kind of pretty much the case that unhappy campers are the ones who call. I think that would be fair to say. So learning how to call and communicate in an effective and appropriate way is important. I will tell you, as someone who has represented agriculture at the state capitol for 29 years, there are a lot of major issues that go through the state capitol for which there are relatively very, very few phone calls. That's the bad news. The good news is that if you and I and all of our organizations work together and we do our job, we move the needle because participation as a whole is so low that when we do our job, we are extremely effective. Now here's the personal example that I use when I'm trying to explain the current farm price squeeze. When I began farming in 1973, which to me does not seem that long ago, I was still doing what I'm doing now, which is trying to figure out what I do when I grow up. I sold all of my corn for $3.30 a bushel. My family bought a new Massey Ferguson 1130 tractor for $11,000 and a new combine with two heads for $37,400. My terminal bid for corn pretty much this whole year north of Newman Grove, and it was last Friday, was $3.29 a bushel. Now, if our cost of living and our cost of production increases since 1973 followed inflation, the income from our commodities today would need to increase 5.5 times just to stay pace with inflation. So yes, as farmers, we need to focus on the need to get paid a fair price for what we produce. We cannot continue to ignore fair value. The past five years have flushed billions of dollars of equity and cash down the creek. Current farm commodity prices are not remotely fair, nor are they economically sustainable. And the one thing we know for sure is that the better agriculture does, the better everyone in our local community, our state, and our nation does, because we are the primary economic driver of new wealth and when agriculture does well, it's good for society as a whole. Now, hard times and economic challenges are certainly not new to agriculture. Our history is filled with a few short-term periods of good economic years that are used to be known as booms, and longer-lasting periods of economic downturns known as busts, or as my grandparents used to describe, panics. Historically, farmers have said 
Uh, as a farm organization person, I can say this. I think all the other farm organizations know what I'm talking about. Historically, farmers have said they don't need to be a member of ag organizations when times are good. And they can't afford to be a member of farm organizations when times are bad. This is not a helpful thinking, I just want to point out. We need to take the long-term view. Our history also tells us that when, when we work together on an ongoing basis within the ag community, we can solve problems. We can build new institutions. We can build cooperatives. We can expand market opportunities. We can expand value added and renewable energy opportunities such as ethanol and wind and solar to expand our income from the natural resources we already control and the ag products that we already produce. So as we look today in agriculture, one of the huge success stories that's only reached a small portion of its total potential, that it would be ethanol. If we can move the needle from 10% to 15% of uh, ethanol in our fuel, that's a 50% increase in the utilization of corn alone. And the tailpipe drippings will get better, and everything that goes with that fuel product gets better. So, well, times are tough. We're going through a tough slog. So who's responsible for fixing what's wrong? Everyone. Whether you are a public official at the federal, state, or local level, I believe you are under obligation to aggressively look for ways to bring remedy. As I begin to bring my remarks to a close, I want to once again thank the Nebraska Rural Radio Association for this award. I want to remind rural Nebraskans to take pride in who you are, what you do for a living, and the communities you come from. Stand up for yourselves in a positive way. Help shape the world around you for the better. And a lot of the old rules of just conduct apply, especially in tough times. If you want good friends or good neighbors, be one. Give the people in your life good, good reputations and help them live up to your high expectations of them. Believe in your ability to be a moral leader and set good examples. While good words are helpful, it's the examples we set by the way we live our lives that are the most powerful, always. The best way to learn how to work together with your neighbors on issues and projects that benefit everybody in your community is to practice. Accept your own responsibility to help yourself. Get involved in organizations that share your values. And it's okay to be a member of any organization that is helping. Step up and assume your responsibilities as a citizen. Participant by getting informed on the issues you face, get constructively involved in the democratic process that shapes the policies that impact you and your community. The best way to learn is to get involved. Sitting on the sidelines in the coffee shop is a lot of fun, but it doesn't get much done. I know this for a fact. When I was the chair of the of the farmers or the uh, Lower Alcorn NRD Budget Committee, I used to I had I farm ground north and south of Tilden. I'd stop in at the local coffee shop, and there are some kind of uh, semi-retired farmers who are really smart guys, and they gave me an incredible detailed insight into what I should do with the budget. And I explained to them how much money we spent on the radio and programs to get them to show up to a budget hearing. And here we were spending several million dollars at a shot and not one member of the public showed up at the hearing. So I explained to them after the hearing was over and they still were offering good ideas that I had gone blind and I had become deaf because if they were actually serious, I would have seen them at the budget hearing and I would have heard them. They told me I could buy the coffee. So, so talk to your public officials in your area, when they're in your area. Attend hearings and see how the process works. Learn how to get constructively engaged. As a former public official, I got to tell you that I know that it's unhappy campers who call up. But I also know that it doesn't do a lot of good to spend a lot of time 
uh, making all kinds of negative and personal attacks on somebody and then asking them to do something to help you. <laughs> this is not a constructive approach. Uh, it is our job at the end of the day as citizens to help shape the direction of our state and nation. Our traditional system of independently owned and operated family farms and ranches is the most efficient, environmentally responsible, economically and socially beneficial way to grow our nation's food, fiber, and fuel. And, importantly, it's also the most consistent with our American history and political values as a democracy. That food production system, known as the, it has been the envy of the rest of the world, is worth believing in. It's worth fighting for. Our traditional system of family farm and ranch agriculture is also the best equipped to effectively respond to our changing weather and climate conditions in the years to come. It has never, in my opinion, been more important for all of us to come together in good spirit, with positive energy, with a positive attitude, and harness the power of cooperation to serve our rural communities and the industry we love and our rural communities. Thank you. Let's uh, thank you, John, for those comments. Thank you for uh, your leadership and spokesman uh, as a great spokesman for agriculture. Thank you again. Thank you again. You bet. Okay.